Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay and everyone's excited for a first launch of a brand new rocket. And not only is it just the first launch, it's not like a, this is going to the moon. <laughs> this is a, a moonshot, which is incredible. I mean, can you imagine your first ever launch of a brand new rocket? Just be like, you know, we're gonna launch something that's going to not only go to the moon, land on the moon. This is an extremely ambitious first launch, but that is the way that ULA would do things because of course ULA has been around for a long time and this is a rocket they've been working on for almost, you know, more or less 10 years. So you would expect a pretty high level of readiness, you know, and certification and and uh, everything. Yeah, a lot of the stuff on this rocket has flown already except for its BE4 engines, but we have a lot to talk about. This is an exciting evening and I'm actually uh, thrilled that, that this is happening now because I'd be really stressed out if this was happening next weekend because next weekend, by this time next weekend, I'll finally be able to breathe because our Astro Awards will be over, which has been like an unbelievable amount of work. And we've been on it now for, oh my God, Mary Liz has been on it for nine, eight, eight and a half months. Uh, I've been working on it more or less full time for three months. Like it's, it's been a lot and uh, we're really excited about who's all coming and, and about you guys all being there. Um, and just a reminder too, uh, before we get into this, before we get into the pre-launch preview, if you go to astroawards.com, astroawards2024.com and you click on the website, you will start to see a list of who are confirmed guests at the Astro Awards, which is extremely exciting. We have so many people coming from the actual missions that were some of the biggest missions in 2023, along with some special fun guests such as Scott Manley, who is DJing the pre-show party. Joe Scott's going to be there just hanging out as a, as a guest. Cyan Proctor as well. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of these people are going to be taking place, uh, taking part in the meet and greet. So if you are around next weekend and you want to do something awesome and, and have a really good time with some incredible people and see people, basically, I think tonight is the Grammys or the Emmys or what is it? We're doing that for space. We're getting these people up on stage and we're going to give them an actual award for the incredible missions. I feel bad that ULA missed this by, uh, by basically eight days because if they had launched in 20, you know, at the end of 2023, they would have definitely been up for an Astro Award, but they will be on 2024's Astro Award list for sure. So uh, if you go to Astro Awards 2024, I also have one more thing to mention about this and then we'll move on. We do have uh, some, we have some additional tickets for the main show and they're on sale 25% off. So for the rest of the week here until the show, if you want 25% off, astroawards2024.com or you can also go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And uh, yeah, you'll see that they're new updated price. We're trying to just make sure we're selling as many of these as we can. So if you're around and available, we hope to see you guys there. AstroAwards2024.com. Check out the all the amazing people. We can't wait to meet people, and uh, the meet and greet stuff is going to be super fun. I'm done clicking around. I'll I'll get into the the meat of this because this is why we're here tonight. This is something again. I've been. I remember hearing before it was even called Vulcan, before it was called anything. I remember I was listening to the Orbital Mechanics podcast. I think it was October. 2014 when they're debating which engine the next United Launch Alliance rocket would have and I think they're even talking about the smart reuse way back then so this has been something I've been thinking about and wanting to see launch for 10 years <laughs> that is crazy this is this and the other one that was big for me uh that obviously launched already was SLS those are the two that have been like the longest and I've been just so excited for this to launch so this is exciting so of course, I saw the same comments as always. You guys, how does this happen? And I did see a lot of people in the comments being like, the pre-launch preview is right there in the description. So if you're one of those people asking, where is this going? When is it launching? Where is it launching from? Is this really their first launch of a rock? Like, it's all right here, everydayastronaut.com. Click on upcoming launches and you'll see all the upcoming launches and articles on a handful of them too. So this is Vulcan, technically it's VC2S or Certification 1, which is launching the Peregrine Lunar Lander maiden flight, taking off today, January 8th. I guess if you're on the West Coast, it's not quite today. You're still in yesterday. Uh, 2024, taking off at 718 UTC, which is uh, 218 and 38 seconds Eastern time. I'm, I'm central, but that's... Uh, yeah, that's the Eastern time. So the mission name is technically again CERT One, uh, the Peregrine Lunar with the Peregrine Lunar Lander. Again, going to the moon, landing on the moon. This is an incredibly exciting first launch. The customer who's paying for this is Astrobotic. 
uh, likely probably very heavily subsidized by Vulcan and or by ULA because it is the first launch ever of their rocket. I'm sure they gave them a pretty nice deal at like, hey, we're going to be launching this thing anyway. You want to just throw a lunar lander up on there and see how it does? And of course, an uncrewed lunar lander, by the way. I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but I will. I will just in case. <laughs> the launch location for this is Space Launch Complex Slick 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. And of course, Slick SLC means it's at space the uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. If it's just LC, that's Launch Complex. Those are technically at Kennedy Space Center. The only two sites active there these days are 39A, LC 39A, LC 39B. Everything else out of uh, Cape Canaveral is all technically at the Space Force side. So you'll see it say SLC, Space Launch Complex. Just always a fun thing to keep in mind. The payload mass. This is not a very heavy lunar lander. It's only 1,283 kilograms. So that's that's why this rocket's able to, to send it uh, with margins to spare. It's actually a lot more capable of, of even this. It's a pretty powerful rocket, but it is not in its full configuration. It's, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second. Where is this going? The actual destination is the uh, Gruthisen Domes on the moon. With uh, initially this perigee uh, is around 490 kilometers uh, and an inclination of 30.03 degrees. So, yeah, so it's going on a TLI, translunar injection, heading out to the moon to eventually land on the moon. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? No, the first stage recovery is not uh, an option for Vulcan yet. However, they do have plans to recover the engines, the BE 4 engines. This will be the first launch ever of the BE-4, which is super exciting, the Methalox engine. This could very well be the first, this should very well be the first Methalox, you know, primarily Methalox powered or, you know, it's, yeah, it's not all Methalox powered because it has a hydro, Hydrolox upper stage. So hydrogen upper stage with the uh, with the Centaur 5 or Centaur V, I think just Centaur 5 upper stage. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, we'll still say it's a Methalox rocket though. For all intents and purposes, the, the majority of the rocket, the booster is, Methalox. So that's pretty exciting. And this, if we want, okay, we'll talk about that here more in a second. Are these fairings new? Uh, yes. Yes, they are. There is no recoverability plans for the fairings that we know of uh, and likely not going to happen. The weather is currently 85% go. So that's fantastic. This would be the first launch of Vulcan ever. The third lunar mission of the Artemis program, because we've had obviously Artemis, uh, you know, Artemis one on SLS. We also had the rocket lab mission with the, um, Oh, what was that called with the, the NRHO mission? That was actually really cool. I'm, I'm totally blanking on it right now. Uh, this is the second robotic lunar mission of the Artemis program. Uh, the fifth orbital launch attempt of 2024. We're, all, we're only eight days and we've already had five orbital launch attempts. This is going to be a busy, busy year for spaceflight. Absolutely crazy. So those are the main facts. Another fun first, I was thinking of like, what else is first? Uh, this is the first time a Methalox rocket will will fly with solid rocket boosters on it. I don't think that's happened before. Um, yeah, so the only other Methalox rockets that have flown, obviously, full-scale, like, orbital class rockets, I'll say class. Uh, Starship, when super heavy, you know, orbital class rocket has not yet made it to orbit, has not yet made it through its test flights. Um, same thing kind of for Relativity's Terran 1. Also had test flights, or a uh, test flight, sorry. And uh, that did not make it to orbit, although the first stage did completely complete a, a burn. They had successful stage separation, which is very exciting. Uh, ZHU-Q2 is the only rocket so far to have made it to orbit twice now using using all Methalox. That is an entirely Methalox-powered rocket. So uh, that takes the title. Otherwise, this would have been close with a little bit of an asterisk, of course, because it's not all Methalox, but it is Methalox-powered, so who knows? Who really cares? Uh, if you want to learn more about the Peregrine Lander, this is the Peregrine Lander. It's it's pretty small and cute and cuddly, uh, but it has a lot of stuff on it. This is the crazy thing. Actually, if you if you read through our pre-launch preview here, you'll notice all of the insane amount of payloads on this tiny Lunar Lander. It has like, look at all these. Most of them are NASA, uh, Goddard, and Langley uh, contributing a lot to this baby. So um, it's it's... It's an exciting mission. I mean, this it's cool that, you know, you can have such a small lunar lander these days packed with so many incredible things. Um, there's also, uh, this is something very special. I, I, I'm sure we'll probably talk about it more, but um, Celestis is the first company to have successfully, uh, they're, they're sending, uh, you know, human remains in the form of ashes into space. And one of them is actually going to the moon. And uh, that's pretty impressive. There's, um, 
Yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty profound, honestly. If you had a loved one that you knew that part of their former remains as a body is now on the moon, pretty impressive and pretty incredible. So a lot of cool stuff on here. Read through our pre-launch preview if you want to learn all about it. And here's the Vulcan. Uh, it is, like I said, it is expendable today, but eventually, hopefully, the BE-4s will be recovered. That is in their plans. Um, I think we're going to tune in right away. I'll try to get to as many questions as I can, guys. Um, but we do have uh, we do have the stream already up for ULA, and I would really like to get to that here uh, so I can listen in and make sure that I'm not missing anything because uh, that makes me a good host is when I'm informed. So well, let's listen in here. I'll try to see if there's good times to answer questions. But uh, meanwhile, thank you for tuning in. I love you guys, and I'm glad that you're up here in the middle of the night to witness history with me. So let's let's tune in and see if we can learn something. He is currently providing us updates on the spacecraft status. Seems very quiet. Let me try and, and Alex just that. informed me that the spacecraft is currently looking nominal. Temperatures and pressures are still as expected. As we continue to await launch, let's send it back to Megan at the host desk. Thank you, Olivia. Again, Peregrine is flying with 20 payloads today. Five of those are NASA's, and throughout the show, we will tell you about each one, starting first with the Linear Energy Transfer Spectrometer. Why is that or not going away? I hate when that doesn't go away. From NASA's away. Johnson there we go. Space Center. Let me know if that's okay volume. I had to crank the gain on I'm it to get Nick it. I'm Nick Stoffel. I'm a physicist and professional and unfortunately, engineer. Unfortunately, we're in the world now where we're probably going to have copyright strikes. I avoid, you guys know this, I'm sure if you watch any other streams like this, that you know, any music, even if the publisher, uh, you know, licensed it, it can cause automatic copyright strikes and even take down streams in the middle of the stream. It's not ideal. So I'm going to say hi real quick. And uh, let's see here. So let's let's keep going here. Let's just, we have a lot of new members. Thank you so much to everyone that's, that's here hanging out. Um, so Wings Soon and Jose um, Vasquez and Astro Joe and Eric Souter. Eric, good to, good to hear from you. Um, Let's see, thank you from X Star Wars and Russell Toy for the membership as well. Um, we have a question here from uh, C4 Corvette. Hey, I, I know what a C4 Corvette is. I read that, it didn't look like what I was, a C4 Corvette. Yes, what do I think will happen to Astro this year? I don't really wanna to speculate too much, especially on a, a public company like that, but, um, oh, they're back. It's launched, so here with me now is Nikki Werkheiser, Director of Technology Maturation. Good morning to you. Good morning. So tell me how STMD, that's the shortened version of the uh, directorate there, tell me how it invests in small business like Astrobotic. Of course, so the Space Technology Mission Directorate, our mantra is technology drives exploration. So if you're really going to create new disruptive technologies that, that, that change the world, you really have to work with a diverse group of individuals. And that means our small businesses, large businesses, international partners, other government agencies. Astrobotic is a shining example of that. Uh, STMD has been working with them for well over a decade. Um, we've awarded uh, over 40 Small Business Innovation Research Awards and our tipping points to develop new technologies for the mission. So is that essentially like seed money? Is that how to yes, consider it? Yes, we're, we're partners, right? We're partners in this. Uh, we say at Artemis, we're going together, and we mean it. We're, we're invested hand in hand in this. And how have those uh, uh, financial awards, how have those helped Astrobotic? So, um, for example, uh, not only do we have science and uh, different uh, payloads aboard the mission, but actually parts of the lander itself, like our navigation Doppler LiDAR that helps with the guidance, navigation, and control, uh, terrain relative navigation that helps to make sure that they can land in safe spots. You know, the moon can be very treacherous. Um, and also the axial thruster engines on the lander itself are brand new engines that have never been flown before that we're testing um, on the moon together. How does it feel to see technologies that your directorate <laughs> developed, you know, helping us get back to the moon? There are not words. Um, I, I really get goosebumps. And, you know, the funny thing is, if you'd asked me as it was a child, of course, it's the amazing engineering and science feats that we see happening. But as a child that was raised in a family of a small business, doing this together. I do have to interrupt for one second because I got to point out now that we have the rocket on screen that it's all white. You can barely see any of the red paint of the beautiful flame paint job. And uh, to remind you guys, that rocket does have a totally different paint job. But now we see it completely covered in white. And you're like, why is that rocket now white? It's all frost. That is, of course, frost because it has methylox on the first stage, hydrolox on the second stage. So... You know that those are both cryogenic propellants so liquid methane liquid oxygen and of course liquid hydrogen all extremely cold because you know it's a relatively thin aluminum skin or stainless steel skin 
uh, on the upper stage. The uh, it means that the uh, oh cool we're looking at some of the lander stuff the Viper Rover R Viper Rover <laughs> Roper. Um, but yeah, the, uh, it's pretty impressive though, because you can see exactly how full, full it is because of where the frost gathers, because it's so stinking cold just on the inside of the, uh, on the inside of that skin. So it's awesome. Um, uh, again, uh, be sure guys, if you, if you have a good question, we'll try and throw it into the queue here. Uh, we, we really, uh, uh, how much, how about this? How much thrust does that stage produce? The first stage is powered by two B4 engines and each one is 2.45 mega newtons. So a little bit more powerful than the Raptor 2 currently, but Raptor 2 will likely surpass it here, and, and potentially, I think, in some tests, has already surpassed the thrust output of the BE-4. But it is, I mean, it's a powerful engine. It's a little more powerful even than, you know, the RS-25. It's about the same size as the RS-25. Um, and so combined, you have 4.9 mega newtons of thrust. Um, each of the solid rocket boosters, the Gem-63s, uh, XLs, there's two of them on this configuration on this first flight, and each one of those actually produces, I think it's another like 2.2 .2 mega newtons of thrust. So all together we're 4.4 plus, yeah, we're just under 10 mega newtons of thrust. So we're more thrust at liftoff than a Falcon 9 by by a decent amount. Falcon 9 is 7.8 or 7.9. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's more powerful than a Falcon 9 in this configuration. They can have up to six of those SRBs. So it can be almost as powerful, not quite as powerful as a Falcon Heavy, but it's, it gets pretty close. So, on the ride, NASA Space Ooh, Launch System rocket. Right now, teams here at Kennedy are processing segments of the two side boosters. Each booster will stand about 17 stories tall and burn approximately six tons of propellant every second, producing 3.6 million pounds of thrust. We continue to march towards today's 45-minute launch window that opens at 2.18 and 38 seconds Eastern Time. The ULA team remains in a planned hold and right now working no issues. As for the Peregrine spacecraft, let's get another check of it from uh, Olivia with Astrobotic. Thank you, Megan. As you may recall, we are currently only monitoring the spacecraft's temperature and pressure while it sits inside the Vulcan rocket's payload fairing. And we're checking in with my team members in Mission Control and Alex Van Hoven, one of our flight directors in the very back row. He is providing us updates directly. Our mission team confirmed the spacecraft's levels are nominal and we continue to be ready for launch. And I'd like to take this time to say a well-deserved shout out to the entire astrobotic team in Pennsylvania, California, and even a few remote workers. I'm sure you're all watching right now, and we thank you for your continued commitment to this mission and to lunar exploration. We really, really couldn't have done it without you. Now, as we sit tight for launch, we'll continue to monitor Peregrine. For now, back to Megan at the host desk. A few minutes ago, I told you about NASA's LETS payload flying on Peregrine today. Now we'll learn about NERVIS, or the Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer System from NASA's Ames Research Center. Good back on him. Hi, my name is Tony Colpreet. I'm the lead scientist for the Near Infrared Volatile... Again, potentially copyright music, so let's get to some of your questions here. Um, well, thank you so much for, from uh, Andrew Driggers saying, I appreciate you and your team's work. I appreciate you saying hi and I'm always thankful for the super chat. Sincerely, that makes us, uh, the whole team, keep the gears moving. There's a lot of gears moving these days and it's it's terrifying sometimes, especially, you know, the lulls and highs and lows of, of, the, of the seasons, basically. Uh, it, it, it's substantial, the, uh, the outpouring from you guys, and I really, really, truly appreciate it. I wanted to mention a fun thing. We're going. We're actually. I've already scripted and, and finished the script, and we're going to shoot a. When I say a quick video, you guys normally don't believe me. I did manage to get a script down under six full pages, so that's only about fifteen minutes of content. We're going to compare the Vulcan to Falcon Nine to Falcon Heavy to Delta Four Heavy and the Atlas Five, and uh, show you everything: the scale, size differences, the thrust, the payload potential, the payload capacity. The, you know, payload volume, the approximate prices that are public, all of the things. So stand by for that. I'll, I'll get that out before we head down to the Astro Awards. So, uh, which I will be leaving the end of this week already to get down there. So uh, stand by for that. I think you guys will love it. It'll be a nice, quick, just right to the point video. And I will be back around 15 minutes after a liftoff to continue monitoring Peregrine. ULA will just, uh, will join us in just a few seconds. 
will. Okay, more definitely copyright music. I'm gonna. That one would have got me. All right, let's see here. Um, sorry, I'm not actually seeing too many super chats in here, or non super chats. I'd love to answer some regular questions if our team is seeing anything here. Uh, Josh Spear, thank you for becoming a member, as well as Tom Kennedy. Again, if we see good questions from you guys, I would love to uh, to answer some of these. Um, here's a, a question from. Um, oh. Good morning. I'm Amanda Sterling, a program management leader and your host for ULA's live coverage of the inaugural Vulcan launch. I'm joining you from ULA's Advanced Spaceflight Operations Center at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Thanks for staying up late or getting up early with us for today's exciting first launch, Vulcan's Certification Flight 1, or CERT-1. This is the first of two planned test flights to support full certification of the Vulcan rocket for U.S. government missions. On board the Vulcan rocket today is Astrobotics Peregrine Commercial Lunar Lander on a mission to intercept the moon, and the Celestis Memorial Spaceflight Payload Enterprise, flying to deep space with the Centaur upper, upper stage. That's right, it's going deep space. Liftoff is scheduled for 2.18.38 a.m. Eastern, and we have a 45-minute launch window this morning. In addition to watching our webcast, you can also follow the live mission progress at ULALaunch.com. About 30 minutes ago, the count entered a 60-minute planned hold. We have two planned holds in our launch count, which give our team additional time to resolve any issues prior to entering the terminal count. At this time, the team is not working any issues, and we're proceeding towards an on-time liftoff. We're excited to partner with NASA on today's live broadcast. Together, we'll be continuing our coverage through end of mission. Building on more than 120 years of combined Atlas and Delta launch experience, ULA's Vulcan rocket introduces a balance of new technologies and innovative features to ensure a reliable and accessible space launch service. Let's hear more about this incredible launch vehicle from ULA Business Development Director Tom Burkholder and Vulcan Chief Engineer RJ Sansom. So RJ, can you discuss a little bit of the uh, when you began the design of Vulcan and what that meant? Yeah, when we started the design of Vulcan, we were looking at our natural security space customer and designing a launch system that would meet their needs. And we focused on being able to provide a lift for the most difficult stressing mission, which is a high energy mission. We designed a launch system that's flexible. We have the ability to add solid rocket boosters, take them off, uh, to tailor the performance that we need for that particular customer's mission. We have an extremely capable upper stage in the Centaur 5 that provides performance that exceeds all the capabilities that our customer needs. And in the end, we've got a launch system that exceeds all of our national security customers' uh, requirements and enables us to provide performance for commercial customers or other customers that uh, um, will meet their needs now and into the future. Uh, that's great. And as uh, we look at the, how the customer received that vision, we definitely saw that they were aligned with it as, as they uh, contributed to the development uh, from the Space Force to NASA and commercial customers. And so I was wondering if you could also talk on the partnerships that you had in the development. Yeah, from the beginning, we partnered with uh, industry partners who have expertise and capabilities to help us bring new innovative technologies, as well as to leverage existing technologies. So we brought a very capable yet new design forward that was a low risk option. We partnered with Northrop Grumman on development of new solid rocket boosters. The first variant of that flew on Atlas with a tailored version that was tailored to provide specific performance for Vulcan. We partnered with Rocketdyne on development of RL-10 and implementation on that, again, first flight on Atlas and then flying again on Vulcan. Partnered with Beyond Gravity on composite structures. And then we partnered with Blue Origin to develop a new main stage propulsion system, the BE-4, the first Oxridge stage combustion engine developed domestically. So, you know, industry partners brought a lot to the table for us. That's great. And then as we look at what this has meant to the market, it's, it's been fantastic. And I was wondering if you could share with me uh, how the Vulcan design has evolved as we've started to look at the commercial market with Project Kuiper. Yeah, we had a really capable launch system to start with. And as we looked at the commercial market and the focus on 
Leo, we de decided that a small change to our design, a small change to the upper stage, would give us increased performance and ability to lift more spacecraft to the low Earth orbit and really position us well for supporting the Kuiper con contract and our Kuiper customer. Yeah, and, and the result of that was the largest launch contract ever. And so with that, Vulcan has positioned UL ULA uh, to help support national security, NASA, and our commercial market. So we're very excited about the future. Sorry, I, I see that my clock is like half in their eyeballs, but I did want to point out the two different clocks you see here. You'll see that ULA's clock currently says, Ooh, Tori Bruno, hold on. We gotta hear this, I'll, I'll fix it and make it look better. Okay. Um, I've been a part of the Vulcan team for a number of years, so I know how focused the whole ULA team has been. Can you talk a little bit about the teams that came together to design, build, and now launch this rocket? I am so proud of our people, and I think we had exactly the best possible team. We've got folks that designed rockets before, like Atlas and Delta, but we also have the majority of our team, people like yourself, that are earlier in their career, know the new tools, aren't sort of handcuffed by some of the conventions that we used before, and can do really creative and innovative work while also not making the mistakes of the past. Absolutely, and you know, Vulcan is such a unique rocket. What are you most proud of about this vehicle? I'm really proud of the fact that we still service the high energy marketplace, a unique thing that is really important to our nation's security, that no one else has an architecture that will do that, while at the same time breaking all the rules and having the dial rocket architecture that gives it the flexibility to reach down into that Leo marketplace and be very competitive there as well. Absolutely. So we're getting pretty close to liftoff now. How do you expect to feel watching the Vulcan rocket lift off for the first time? Tremendous excitement and anticipation. I got to tell you, I've done over 400 launches. They're all the same. I always get butterflies. This one's really special because of what it means to our country, to our customers, and to the team that has worked so hard, including you, Agent Sterling. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll let you get back to it so you can make sure you watch liftoff and... Uh, Let's go. <laughs> go Vulcan. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Tori Bruno, CEO of ULA, he is fantastic. He is a rocket nerd's rocket nerd, and he knows this vehicle inside and out. Um, I was going to point out a few things. What was I talking about? There's um, a few things. We have a lot of good questions now coming in. Oh, I was going to talk about the clocks. So you'll notice that I kind of covered up the ULA part. Sorry, ULA. It's, it's nothing against you. Just wanted to make it so it made sense. We have what's essentially... The, the L minus, the launch minus time, while, so that's when it's going to take off is, is in about 17 minutes from right now. But the way that ULA is operated is kind of in a more traditional sense where they, they have a, uh, the countdown and then they put it into a hold and then like there's a terminal countdown with, uh, you know, where it's all preloaded. Oh, this is cool. That looks like Mastin's vehicle. Yes, it is. That's awesome. Uh, but anyway, so the point being, uh, it's the hold is normal. And the fact that the clock is stopped at T minus seven is actually, it's been there for almost an hour now. And that's actually normal for them. So when they get into, they're going to do the go, no go pull. And then, uh, assuming everything is good to go, then they literally will basically say go and load that software at T minus seven minutes and, and put the vehicle into its final stages of flight. So we're, we're showing you the countdown of like real time they currently have their internal clocks stopped at T minus seven. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of confusing, but it's just sort of the way they do things where you still have the manual process to make sure the go, no, go pulls good. And then they hit, okay, go. So yeah, that's just kind of how that works. Um, yeah. So let's get through um, a few of your questions here while we can. And, and again, after the launch, I'll probably stick around for a little bit because we actually have some really good questions coming in now. Uh, so just want to say again, thank you to everyone. And if I don't get a chance to answer everything tonight, I'll sure try. But uh, Matt, Matt uh, Schroeder wants to know if I've heard of space engine systems testing a ramjet for hypersonic flight in Canada. I have not heard anything about that, but ramjets and hypersonic flights are awesome. Um, because so they're talking about the Celestis uh, space flight mission, which unfortunately has music as well. So we'll keep going. Celeste is very cool, though. That these are remains of of. Uh, of loved ones, which I think would be a really special way to send someone off, literally. <laughs> um, 
Jordan Shaw says, uh, any idea what percentage in terms of cost of the vehicle they'll save with Smart? Will Vulcan be focused on expendable missions? The heavy capability is good. So the cool thing about Smart Reuse is it won't really uh, have too much of a payload penalty. So they'll be able to reuse the engines, but still burn through depletion of the first stage, which is really exciting as far as a performance standpoint. It should have very minimal impact on the actual payload performance using Smart Reuse. Um, each engine is, I think, somewhere between eight to ten million dollars, so they're not cheap. Ooh. Roger. Vulcan hydraulics to standby. That's what they said. Sorry that I missed it. Today's rocket includes the American flag across the inner stage, as well as logos on the payload fairing representing ULA, Vulcan, and Astrobotic. While this is the inaugural launch of the Vulcan rocket. The CERT-1 flight test marks ULA's 159th launch. Let's learn more about this innovative new rocket. So they'll, they'll talk about things that we've probably already talked about. Um, so, uh, so realistically, you know, you have some recovery costs obviously built in and refurbishment costs of the engines, but still any 16 to $20 million is definitely worth pursuing reusability on and uh, could really help them at least be more competitive and or have higher profit margins by reusing the engine. So probably safe to say, I mean, there's they sold uh, 11 flights for $118 million on average uh, to Space Force. So um, let's say that they can save, you know, $20 million on their costs. Uh, we, could, we could probably safely assume that this rocket might cost them, I don't know, 80 to $90 million to, to actually make and fly. And so if they could bring... 20 million down from that cost or well not 10 we'll say 15 million down from that cost that greatly increases their profit potential profit margin so um definitely a, a a good thing for them to be pursuing and i'm excited that they are working on that and they even did the the lofted hypersonic re-entry test using an inflatable heat shield like they plan to use for vulcan so very cool daniel hick thanks for the stream watching from australian prime time go vulcan fantastic daniel thank you for uh for hanging out with us in the in the middle of the day for you and uh yeah greatly appreciate you saying hi uh from edmund wanted to know if we plan to sell any russian rocket models of russian rockets yes someday i want to have like the whole kit and caboodle i really want to have a soyuz and i really want to have a baron and an energia rocket so bad so yes for my sake i do want to have one 100 skills of all the most popular rockets. I also have obviously a fondness towards the N1. I think the N1's one of the wackiest rockets to ever fly. So um, yes, definitely want to get there in the future. Uh, at this rate, considering we're going to release a model every two or three years, that'll happen in 2062. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Speaking of rockets, from uh, Speed Freak TV. Hey Tim, got my Falcon 9 rocket. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Do you plan to make any more? I, yes, actually. So like I said, everything, but we are, I just received the prototypes recently. I wish they're with me right here, right now. I'd show you them. But the next ones we're releasing is a, a two pack of the Mercury programs, so the Mercury Atlas and Mercury uh, Redstone. So you can see it compared to the scale of the Falcon 9. They're all at the same scale, the same one 100 scale. Man, I wish I had that with me right now. Um, because it is really fun to see them in the same scale. So that's going to be our next ones. Operational silence in the LCC. Go LOX2. Center LO2 at flight level. Roger. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint, any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel 1, identify the station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. RLM, verify redline monitor and event table on the correct configuration for terminal count. Verify. As we approach the terminal count pole, let's check in on today's weather. The Space Launch Delta 45 forecast for this, morning la this morning's launch is looking good. The probability of violating launch constraints is 15%. Ground winds are 15 to 20 knots out of the north, and the temperature is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. The primary concern for launch is the thick cloud layers rule. L minus 11 minutes. We're getting there. Weather's looking good. Vehicle's looking good. Of course, the, 
The, you see fire on the screen that's normal. They actually have two flare stacks because they have a flare stack for the hydrogen from the upper we stage. We remain in the plant. And of course they have a, a flare stack for the methalox, or, the, or sorry, just the methane on the booster. So we're coming up on the launch readiness poll here and we will tune in for that for sure. So, so don't panic when you see those flames off to the side, those are normal. Um, and also don't panic when you see what looks like smoke and condensation pouring off the rocket as it's sitting there now. That is just the cryogenic propellant boiling off and being released uh, into the atmosphere, causing condensation. So, holy moly, that's quite the launch team. That's a lot of people. I love that so many people are tuned in right now. All right, here we go. Status check. All minus five minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count, Vulcan systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LNG. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems. Propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems. Airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GC cubed. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Yes. Proceeding with the count. ALC. Verify T0 is set for 0718-38 Zulu. Verified. Love to hear it. Polling is complete, and the team is go for launch. From T-minus seven minutes until liftoff, you'll hear Dylan Rice and the team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. Several critical activities occur in the final minutes before launch, including verifying fuel tank levels and pressures in the booster and Centaur, and arming the flight termination system. At T-minus one minute, the range operations commander confirms the range is in a green condition for launch. At T-minus 25 seconds, you'll hear, Go Vulcan, Go Centaur, Go Peregrine. This is the final status check of rocket and payload readiness. At T-minus 7 seconds, Rofi sparklers will ignite, followed a second later by initiation of the launch pad water deluge system. At T-minus 3 seconds, the main engines ignite. Then, after seeing Vulcan's first ever liftoff from Slick 41, you'll begin hearing flight commentator Rob Gannon providing launch vehicle ascent data. Someone asking in chat if this is flying north or south. It's flying pretty much due east since it's going on a TLI. It's actually, I believe, 30 degrees east, so pretty much due east from Kennedy Space Center. So, uh, unfortunately, the worst, if you're along the coast north or south of, of the Cape, uh, you won't see it as well as like if it was going to the International Space Station or something. So... I'm going to try to make sure our clock is synced, which we look to be a little bit ahead. Vulcan Mission Control at T minus seven minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. On my mark, the time will be T minus seven minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. How'd I do? 6.55 way off. Ground pyros enabled. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 2.18.38 a.m. Eastern. After liftoff, ULA's Vulcan rocket will head east from Space Launch Complex 41. Here's a look at today's ascent. Following final <laughs> I'm so nervous about that. All right, I'm going to get it closer to the... I'm trying to sync up our clocks so that we have that reference. We're close. I'm now about four and a half seconds ahead still. Okay, I can do this. Give me one second. And hopefully this is about right. Let's see if I'm right. And boom, how did I do? Somehow, not great. <laughs> Let's try it again. 
the fun game. So how can how far can Tim be off before it's acceptable? And I think we're within one second now. Here we go. I'm happy with that. Good enough. Cool. Okay. So you can see beautiful renders actually of of Vulcan. I watched this video earlier. The one the one complaint I do have about it is. As it ascends in real life, the flames will get wider and wider and wider because the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner. So the thing that keeps flames coming out of a rocket nozzle in is the atmosphere. We have one bar or 14.7 PSI of pressure at sea level or approximately. And so even though the rocket exhaust is moving very quickly, it's actually at sea level, it's actually lower pressure than the atmosphere. And the atmosphere actually squeezes it in. That's why you see those beautiful mock diamonds. And as the rocket ascends, the, the atmosphere, you know, becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. And so it's relatively lower pressure compared to the nozzle exit of the engine. So therefore, the when the exhaust leaves the nozzle, it'll start going out and the higher and higher it gets, it literally starts to like shoot out because it's in a vacuum. It shoots out like in all directions. So that's why you want as long of a nozzle in space as you can. So you can straighten out that flow as much as possible and lower the, amb the pressure of the exhaust as much as possible to get it as close to a vacuum as you can. I mean, it's... You're never gonna get it down to a vacuum, uh, obviously, but you can you can get pretty darn close. A uh, great question here from uh, uh, Yehuda Langer asking, will New Glenn and Vulcan be similar machines? In the sense that they're both rockets and they both use the BE-4, but they're quite different vehicles. Well, and they both have Hydrolox upper stages and two, and in some ways, yes. Um, but New Glenn's actually going to be more capable than, than Vulcan. Uh, to, but it's also re, a reusable first stage, but it's also much, much, much larger. I mean, it's seven meters wide compared to 5.4 meters wide, uh, stands something like 95 meters tall compared to, I should almost throw that into the comparison. Oh, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> Crap. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, in some ways they're, they're quite similar in other ways, you know, not at all. Um, but just even having the first stage be reusable puts it, more kind of similar to a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy. But uh, but yeah, and they're both obviously, both engines, the BE-4 is built by ULA. I mean, by Blue Origin. All right, let's listen in here. Um, one more question here from uh, Trevor asking, pumped to be with you watching this amazing rocket. Thank you so much. Uh, how long do you think it'll be before we see them attempt engine recovery? Um, I, I don't know. They have made some progress towards you know, testing certain things such as the, uh, you know, like I said, the, the inflatable heat shield has been tested. Um, I don't know. I would, I'd hope that, you know, within the first 10, they really haven't talked about it too much, but I would hope within the first like 10 flights, we actually see them going for that. FTS internal. Two thirty eight. What a great time to have my computer crash. <laughs> I'm back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with me. <sighs> How does that happen? Wow. Just add some drama. Just trying to spice things up. Not at all. <laughs> Why? Sweet. Yes, let's go. <gasps> yes. Oh. 
got pitching yaw programs in, coming into normal rates for that event. We have good hydraulic pressure on both engines. Good chamber pressure on both engines, everything looking good. Sorry guys. Got my setup. Coming oh, up on 60 going, seconds baby. into the flight, everything looking good. Yes! Good engines, two good SRBs. Body rates look good, nice and smooth. And we've hit our first throttle point on the BE-4, is everything looking good? Yes. And we have passed through Mach 1, we are now supersonic, coming up on max Q. That max dynamic pressure, everything looking good, we're rolling off on the SRBs. And we have cutoff on the SRBs, coming up on jettison in approximately 30 seconds. Dang! Hold on to them for 30 seconds. 15 seconds to SRB jet, BE4s continue to operate nominally. I used to do this too, with the Atlas does this sometimes too, where it holds on Seeing to Seeing expected PU activity on the boost remains. And we have separation of both SRBs. Everything looking good, BE4s continue to operate normally. Yes, BE4s do it! On two minutes into the mission. We are now 17 miles in altitude. We just heard confirmation of solid rocket booster jettison. We have about three minutes until we reach our next mission event, booster engine cutoff. And we see booster PU correcting towards the nominal MR, everything looking good. Don't forget, it's blue because it's methylized, Both engines it's methane. Normally. Bluish purplish, it's this beautiful hue. Oh, that's so pretty. And this we now weigh approximately half of our liftoff weight. Everything looking good. Yes. And we fired the power valve, activating the reaction control system. On the upper stage, pressures are rising. As expected, PE4 continues to operate normally. There you go. Good job, Blue Origin. On the BE-4, in case you're confused why I said good job, Blue Origin. <laughs> Vehicles continue to fly down the center of the range track. Everything looking good. In Discord, uh, 120... 33 up. miles in altitude, 52 miles downrange, traveling at... The, the thrust does look asymmetrical, and that's because you're having those plume-plume interactions of the two engines. So you'll have the spot where the two flames are coming in contact. We're only seeing 180 degrees worth of the vehicle. So we have what looks like a jet shooting out sideways. That's the interaction of those two engine flames, engine plumes. Similar to the uh, to the RD-180, when you have two engines interacting like that. Vehicle steadily accelerating, a little over 2 Gs at this time. Good body rates. Nice and smooth operation of the booster. 47 miles in altitude, 95 miles downrange at 5,500 miles per hour. Fantastic. The, the stage runs Engines for so continue long. continue to burn normally. Everything looking good. The stage runs for so long compared to what we're used to with Falcon 9 and Starship and things like that. And the vehicle now weighs one quarter of its liftoff weight as we pass through the Carmen line. It's made it to space. Next mark went we're looking for is Boost Space Chill Gun on the Centaur main engines. Booster mains continue to operate normally. Fantastic. It burns so long. For five minutes, those BE-4s are running. And we've begun boost phase chill. Housing temps are dropping as expected. Coming up to the end of boost phase. Approximately 10 seconds to BECO. Throttle down Bico. in preparation for BECO. We've Booster completed engine. boost phase chill down. And we have cutoff. Coming up on Vulcan Centaur separation. We have Vulcan Centaur separation. That's Everything big. looking good. Coming up on the Centaur phase. Dual RL 10 Cs. Oh, cool. And experiencing Look at data that. loss here. We've recovered the data. It's like Centaur engines are up and running normally, good steady state pressure, and we've just jettisoned the payload fairing. Two good brake wires. 
Yes. Now, I do, I do need to point out, although this looks just like an animation, I believe this is actually connected to real-time telemetry, this uh, this graphic that we see. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 5 minutes 57 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Rob Gannon confirm the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. Our next event, main engine cutoff, will occur in about 10 minutes. While we wait, I'm joined by Amanda Bichetti, ULA Director of Vehicle Upgrades. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's still early, but congratulations. Thank you. You as well. This is amazing. <laughs> How did it feel to watch the Vulcan rocket lift off for the first time? Oh, a just absolutely amazing. I didn't expect it to be the way it was. It just my heart is still pounding. It was excellent. And just I'm so proud of all the work that the team did to get where we are today. Absolutely. And developing a new rocket is an enormous endeavor of which you were a huge part. Um, again, we're still early, but how do you imagine the whole Vulcan team is feeling right now? I, I feel like they have to be the same way, you know, smile ear to ear. I know the team is at all our sites, friends and family. They've been supporting us for many years to get to where we are. So I'm sure they are jumping up and down just like me. It's been amazing. How is the Vulcan rocket going to change the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. So Vulcan is very much based on our heritage rockets, the Delta IV and Atlas V vehicles, but we've brought in a lot of new innovation and capabilities that are going to allow us to even better support our warfighters, exploration, as well as connecting the world. And the great thing about Vulcan is it's highly versatile, meaning we can use that vehicle to do anything we want, allows for affordability for anybody who needs access to space. So I'm seeing a lot of comments that I want to address real quick. People saying the pad appears to be on fire. Uh, don't speculate too much on that. Don't forget there are two big flare stacks that will remain flaring uh, as time goes on. I don't know if there's... Uh, let's not speculate on that too much. It is normal to see fires of, a, of an active pad like that when there is methane in the system um, as a... Methane and hydrogen. So they have two flare stacks. So don't, don't get too uh, excited or worried at this point. Um, I, I think everything's fine. That looks totally like the flare stack to me, though. Back there. Yep, flare stack. I saw it go down for just a second there. So um, we have a lot of great questions, by the way. I, I will stick around for a little bit here, even after uh, most of this mission. I, I think I'll try to get, I don't remember the time. 100 seconds into the mission. Everything's looking good. Continuing to burn Centaur. Good point in Body rate Discord. Ready as expected. Steady acceleration, just under half a G. So and we are now. 235 miles in altitude, 836 miles downrange, traveling at 11,150 miles per hour. So that's like 17,500 or so kilometers an hour. So they're about two-thirds the way to orbital velocity, more or less. Um, real rough math there, sorry. Um, we should point out, yeah, in Discord, uh, uh, let's see, Bradley mentioned this is the first, uh, the very first oxygen-rich closed cycle engine built in the United States to actually, I guess, make it to the Kármán line. We've never had an oxygen rich only. So obviously Raptors now made it above the Kármán line. Uh, and this is the first US built ox rich closed cycle engine to make it to space. So if you don't know what that means, by the way, I did have some people asking me, you know, could we compare that to the Raptor? A lot of other things. Don't forget to do, of course, have the Raptor engine video that did compare the BE-4 in it, ironically, actually almost five years ago now. But there's also my videos that have come out with more recently. How do you power a rocket engine? Uh, does talk about the cycle types. And uh, yeah, closed cycle, oxygen rich uh, is, has been a thing that the Soviets absolutely mastered, of course, in the uh, developing it in the 50s already and launching it in the 60s on the R7 rocket um, and the Molina, Mol Molnia specifically uh, variant. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something though that we've never actually done. An oxygen rich, pure oxygen rich, uh, closed cycle. So it's very cool. High performance. Um, it's, it's impressive. It takes the hardest part about it is that oxygen when it's hot, especially wants to just absolutely react with everything. So your turbine blades, your housings, all of the, all of the areas that experience hot, uh, gaseous oxygen just want to explode. <laughs> so yeah, they are, they are absolutely crushing it. So this is fantastic. 
Uh, let's listen in here real quick. I ran outside so I can watch this thing lift off, and that was so cool after so many years of development to uh, to watch this thing fly. That was fantastic. Absolutely, I bet. Yeah. So um, what is the data showing us so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I've had a very quick look. Uh, obviously, we're very early in the flight still, uh, but I've taken a look at the SRB performance as well as the booster performance so far, and everything looks just spot on, just perfect. Um, you know, fortunately, we've had a lot of these systems on Atlas and Delta for a long time, and so we've had a lot of flight data to anchor our models, and everything is lining up just like we would expect. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, a lot of the audience has seen us switch from this live view of the launch from our rocket cam to this uh, animated representation of the vehicle in space. Can you talk a little bit about why we make that switch and how this visual is populated? Yeah, absolutely. So when we first lift off, we have a feed directly from the uh, cameras that are on the uh, rocket back to the launch site here. And so with that, we can get the, vi the video feed that we need in order to provide those images. As we get further downrange and we go over the horizon, we no longer have that direct link. And so we rely on NASA's TDRS system to send telemetry from the vehicle back down to us on the ground. In that telemetry data, we get information like position and attitude and velocity. And so we use that to drive the animations you see here. OK, so we're looking at real data, what's happening. It's just a graphic of it instead of the real thing. That's exactly right, yes. Awesome, that's really cool. So you know, today we have, right now, we're in the first of three Centaur burns. Can you talk a little bit about why we need three burns and how we use those three burns to c complete our mission today? Yeah, absolutely. So the first burn uh, performs our injection into low Earth orbit. Unfortunately, if we just continue that burn from that point in time, we wouldn't necessarily be aligned uh, with where we need to be in order to get to the moon. So what we do after we get to low Earth orbit is we shut those engines down, we coast around until we get to the right spot to do that, and then we light those engines up again. When we do that and complete that burn, that will allow us to uh, send the astrobotic um, Peregrine lander uh, onto the moon. So we shut those down engines down again, and we are, are ready to do that and then start them up one more time in order to do the third burn. And that's what's going to take Celestis's Enterprise mission out to deep space. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where these things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go ahead and shut down the, um, the main engines uh, on the Centaur when we get about halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. And then we're going to coast the rest of the way across the Atlantic Ocean, across Africa, and go ahead and start the engines up again when we get to Madagascar. And that's where we'll do the second burn. And then we coast again until we get um, about to Papua New Guinea. And when we get to about to over Papua New Guinea, that's where we'll go ahead and, and do that third and final burn. OK, so you mentioned a couple of these key milestones that are ahead of us. What can everyone expect to see as far as the timeline of these mission events as, as they continue watching today? Yeah, absolutely. So looking at the clock right now, looks like we've got uh, about two minutes, a little over two minutes left uh, here in the, um, the first part of the upper stage. We're going to coast for about 30 minutes after that as we do get that, uh, that coast across the Atlantic Ocean and across Africa. The second burn will be about four minutes long, and then we'll have another coast for 30 minutes before we have a pretty short, like 20 second burn uh, for the final burn. Uh, once we've done that, then we've got some uh, engineering demos we're going to do before we finally safe the stage and shut everything off. And then and about four days later is when uh, the Centaur will leave the Earth-Moon system and be on its way to deep space. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing with that with us. And thanks for, for joining us today. And uh, we'll let you get back to, to watching those next events. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks. Fantastic. It's exciting. So don't forget, they do call the Centaur, the upper stage engines, the main engines. And they consider the first stage to be booster engines. So. You might hear them say main engine cut off and main engine cut off two and all those things. They're specifically talking about the the, the upper stage. It's just kind of unique. Uh, something that ULA does that's a bit unique. But I'm I'm thrilled. This is fantastic. And it is hilarious. A lot of comments. And Joe Bernard had a hilarious tweet saying, uh, going so well, but laugh uh, LMAO at this cute little toaster getting yeeted. Because it does put into perspective just how tiny... Uh, that lunar lander is, you know, this is uh, a, a really small lunar lander for the Eclipse program for NASA. So it's, it is tiny. It's meant to be small and, and inexpensive and still packed full of science and, and data, uh, scientific instruments and be able to provide some valuable data. Um, but it's, it is very small compared to the 5.4 meter wide uh, Centaur 5 upper stage. I mean, it is, uh, yeah, absolutely crazy. 
Um, I did want to answer, we had some great questions, um, including how long will it take to get to the moon? So it's, it's uh, everything's going well. The original nominal flight plan gets the Peregrine Lander uh, there on February 23rd. So it's actually quite a ways. Oh, we're coming up on Mika 1. Here we go. On to open loop control on Miko. We have cutoff. Both engines show normal shutdown signatures. We have settling established, 85% duty cycle. We are now in a 27 minute, 51 second coast duration to second burn of Centaur. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 16 minutes, 20 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Rob Gannon confirm successful cutoff of the first main engine, and all systems continue to operate nominally. Our next event, Amazing. main engine start two, will occur in about 27 minutes. At this time, we'll pass the broadcast back to the NASA team to continue with mission coverage through the coast phase. We'll join you back in as we approach the separation of the Peregrine spacecraft. Over to you, Megan. Okay, I gotta, I gotta add a lot of comments here because this is fantastic. So we're 27 minute uh coast phase here so i'm gonna i'm gonna switch over to this and uh let's answer a lot of questions and this is just so fun to, to talk about because there's i first off they made it to orbit vulcan made it to orbit on its first launch granted it has a very ambitious two more burns to build to do before it's completed its official uh mission getting the peregrine lander uh on a tli translunar injection towards the moon of course um so but still i mean it made it to orbit it's in orbit fantastic i mean that is a huge a huge deal for a first launch of a rocket to be honest it's, it's similar to sls you know where i expected because of the developmental decisions that ula and, and more traditional aerospace manufacturers you know like boeing lockheed uh the the way that they do things you do expect a higher level of success like this so i'm just absolutely thrilled that it goes that it went to plan uh so far and that the b4 has performed what looked like phenomenally well, you know, everything looked perfect right down the, right down the bullseye. Um, I know a lot of people are going, all oh, those B4s, you can't trust them. I had no data telling me not to trust them. If they certified them for flight and said they're good to go, then I would trust the people that are designing, engineering, and testing those engines more than people that just say, oh, the B4, they'll never get those going. Um, I'm just thrilled. Oh, by the way, it looks like their end, their table appears to be the braze welded, uh, cooling tubes. Hang on, I gotta make this the other way around so you guys can see this a little bit better. Oh, right when I cut it, it switched shots. But it appears to be the cooling tubes of part of the RL10 engine. So I hope they go back to that shot. You can you can just get a real small glimpse of it. Ah, oh, come on, go back to that shot. I just I just want to see it. I'm pretty sure it was cooling tubes of part of the thrust chamber of the RL10 engine. It was very 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 cool. Um, all right, let's, let's, um, this is a fantastic question from Eric. And again, remember, I'm just going to be answering questions here. You don't have to be doing super chats. Greatly appreciate those who do, but you know, we're just going to answer some good questions too, such as this one from Eric Iglesias asking question. Is it possible to have a payload of, let's say marbles of bearings to create artificial meteor showers? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was a company called star ale that actually was planning to do exactly that. Do big artificial meteor showers almost like fireworks you'd order them up for, order them up for like a big event like say the olympics or the super bowl or something and they would basically have a re-entry of of thermite and other you know copper elements and things like that, that would glow and create these big streaks across the sky uh that would obviously burn up before they ever, ever got anywhere near the ground but hopefully creating a spectacular uh just show for for those on the ground um i haven't heard anything more about them it's been several years but I think that's pretty awesome. So, um, there we go. Now we can see the table. There we go. Do you see the uh, the table? Looks like it has the the tubes, the brazed tubes of the cooling passages of an RL10. I don't know if it is, but if it if it's not, it's a cool little nod to it. So, um, wait, 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 wait. Is this actually? She did just say something. Sorry, I don't have it, the volume up for you guys. But I, she did just say 
This is the first lunar landing since the Apollo missions. Have we not sent a single other lunar lander? Are we as irresponsible as, this, as Russia who just tried to launch a lunar lander last year? It didn't work. Is this, that's true, right? For the US, for the US, US landed. That's what I mean, like the United States, sorry. Because yeah, obviously China's landed a few times now. Uh, Chandrayaan 3. That's crazy. Dang. That's that's it for who is, uh, you know, we also had, uh, we've had other attempts. You know, we had the, uh, oh God, who was that? UAE had that lander. But man, I hope this, this works out for Astrobotic because this is a, a very cool, yeah, this is fun. Okay, so. Uh, let's let's keep going here with questions. How good is the BE-4? Is ULA being too optimistic putting payload on the first try of an untested rocket? You tell me. You tell me. I think the BE-4 did pretty darn good. Um, by the way, this obviously is neither what you're seeing on screen up up, up here is neither to scale nor uh, anywhere near the correct uh, things. So it... So it, uh, yeah... Okay, sorry. Um, I do actually want to hear this. this 33 is about hours. Peregrine's orbit. Peregrine's second that. orbit can be up to 35 days. The spacecraft's third and final orbit around the moon will last 48 hours. Next up, Peregrine will attempt a soft landing on the lunar surface autonomously. The team will issue a landing sequence that will command the spacecraft to enter a descent orbit. About 15 kilometers from the lunar surface, an exciting powered descent begins. While we wait for the Peregrine spacecraft to separate from the Vulcan rocket and begin that exciting journey to the moon, I have Astrobotics founder and chief executive officer, John Thornton. Hi there, John. I understand you are currently at ULA, just a stone's throw from where I am now, and we both just saw ULA's Vulcan rocket achieve liftoff with our very own Peregrine aboard. Tell me, after waiting for this moment for years, how are you feeling? It, it's a dream. Uh, this is the moment we've been waiting for for 16 years, and I'm standing in mission control, and we just had a beautiful launch. Thank you, ULA. Um, so, so, so excited. We are on our way to the moon. I That's can awesome. Let's, I've, got a, I've got a huge queue of really good questions. I, I don't mean to interrupt the people that are actually the ones behind these missions, but, hey, I mean, right now these people we might see at next year's Astro Awards. Uh, you know, we'll definitely see – well, I mean – Everything's been going super smooth, so let's cross our fingers that uh, that Astrobotic lands on the moon, and they'll definitely be up for an Astro Award for sure. So, fantastic. Um, th this is from Poltab. How many Blue Origin rocket engines have designs have successfully made it to space? So, um, to space, if you're qu quantifying it as, as made it to space or fired in space, because these BE-4s are the first... ULA engines to ever fire in space besides little cold gas thrusters on New Shepard because the BE-3U or BE-3, sorry, on the New Shepard rocket is never runs in space. It, it runs only, um, I think it cuts off somewhere around 20 kilometers or something like that. Um, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it's it's in the, it's still in well within the atmosphere. Um and then it coasts up the rest of the way. It might actually be 50 kilometers, actually, now that I think about it. I think it's almost halfway um, when it when it experiences cutoff. But still, I mean, it's I guess by that point, it's more or less. It's more in space than it's not by a lot. Um, but technically, this is the first time they've run engines in the vacuum of space uh, or above the Kármán line, if we're using the Kármán line as the, the, de the, the definition of space, which I tend to use, which is 100 kilometers. So how many Blue Origin engines have successfully made it to space? Two have fired in space, and then all of the New Shepard missions, except for the in-flight abort, and which I actually, I think technically that one didn't make it to space too, believe it or not. And then the the failure from last year was the first one um, to not make it to space, I believe, by my, I'm just off the top of my head. So what is that, 20-ish, 22-ish, somewhere around there. Uh, these, this is from Lob Goblin. Are these fairings bigger than the ones used on recent launch from China? I heard, I heard those are pretty large. Um, 
I think this is substantially bigger still. I think China does have. Uh, oh, I need to. I need to make a video about the Chinese launch vehicles because it's changing rapidly. But they do have the new Long March variant that has a huge fairing. I think it's seven meters though, and this is five point four. Um, I think it's it's more like New Glenn size fairing, but that's off the top of my head. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, this is from uh, Vokader. Hey, hey, love your streams. Can you cover big differences between BE4 and SpaceX engines? Yeah. Let me uh, just talk about that briefly. Again, we do cover that in my old video, you know, is SpaceX's Raptor engine the king of rocket engines? We also talk about it a little bit in how to power a rocket engine, which I highly recommend that video. If you have not seen that video, uh, why don't rocket engines melt? And how do you start a rocket engine? If you watch those through those three videos, I guarantee you'll have a fantastic understanding of how rocket engines work all together because we cover most of the major uh, things that make rocket engines work, including startup, of course, and how you keep them from melting and how you power them, which is actually powering a rocket engine is basically the entire rocket engine right there is, is, is how you power it. If you don't power it, you don't have a rocket engine. So, um, so the B4 is... Uh, two two point four five meganewtons of thrust at sea level, um, compared to Raptor's currently around two point three, uh, but it's likely going to increase, and maybe they already have ones that are two point five meganewtons. So actually, they're around the same relative thrust output. However, BE four is physically about twice as large, and likely you could probably speculate around twice as heavy, or maybe not quite twice as heavy, but heavier, um, and therefore likely has a lower thrust to weight ratio than Raptor. Um, Raptor utilizes the full flow stage combustion cycle, whereas BE4 is just oxygen rich closed cycle engine. Um, they both run on Methalox, shout out Methalox, which by the way, uh, Methalox merch, if you guys do want Methalox merch, which does feature some, some nerdy stuff on it. For those of you that like nerdy stuff, like I do, uh, da, da, da. I don't know if I'm standing in the way of stuff, but there you go. Um, a lot of good nerdiness on the back of this thing. Talking about Methalox, talking about some of the 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 things that the advantages of Methalox, uh, which of course is liquid methane, liquid oxygen. Um, everydayastronaut.com slash shop if you guys do want to support that, and you can take uh, you can take fifteen percent off if you use coupon code launch day. So yeah, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Anything, any of our Methalox merch, including our Methalox hoodie and our Methalox tee, fifteen percent off. Coupon code launch day, all one word, all lowercase. Uh, these are fantastic. This is my favorite hoodie now. I, I, I haven't stopped wearing it because I'm a dork. And while we're talking about the shop real quick again, I do need to mention, again, tickets are on sale and they're 25% off this week for the general admission tickets. If you guys want to come to the first ever Astro Awards, which of course feature many cool guests, including here. If you go to astroawards2024.com, where is that? If you go to astroawards2024.com, you'll see our confirmed list. We have more to come. Oh, you're seeing, you guys are seeing a dumb little, you're not seeing anything. Were you seeing anything? I'm bad at this. I'm bad at streaming today. You can see our confirmed guest list, including Scott Manley, who is DJing the pre-party, uh, Cyan Proctor. Um, we have engineers coming from, from NASA for the Psyche mission, from Rocket Lab, uh, from Virgin Galactic, from Stoke, from Relativity, from the Space Force. Uh, it's going to be fantastic from Euclid. It's going to be really, really fun. Again, that is coming up already in uh, Saturday and Sunday. So Saturday night is the pre-show party. Sunday is the actual award show. Um, AstroAwards2024.com or when you're just at everydayastronaut.com slash shop, you will also see that there. So um, yeah, sorry, I didn't even, yeah, I had the whole thing wrong. I'm, had a computer crash. I'm not even showing you the right things. Man, I am rookie stuff here. And I've been streaming a lot more than normal lately too. So man, what is my excuse? Okay, so there we go. Those are the main differences between the BE-4 and the Raptor engine. Uh, again, yeah, both run on Methalox, which is kind of the propulsion, you know, rocket fuel of the of the future. Uh, it's, it's more sustainable than Carolox. It's higher, it has the potential to be a lot higher performing than Carolox. Um, and often at times in a lot of situations can even be higher performing, uh, at least for a booster stage uh, compared to Hydrolox because it's more a lot more dense compared to hydrogen. So there you go. Thank you, Vokader, for the question and the support. Um, let's see. Can I CGI in some Delta IV flames at launch? We didn't even need to because it was still a pretty spectacular launch. Uh, 
Uh, I loved the, you know, liftoff. It, it did veer away from the tower. I assume some of that is on purpose to make sure that, that it doesn't torch that beautiful crew launch tower that will be utilized here soon for Atlas with Starliner. So I'm guessing they intentionally, yeah, did that. So um, let's see. The, this is from uh, Bear King 08 Say this rocket has baby rocket boosters. Yeah, but I know those Gem 63 XLs don't look that big compared to the massive 5.4 meter wide body of the vehicle. They are quite powerful. Each one of those boosters, again, produces 2.2 meganewtons of thrust. So basically every booster they're strapping on produces about as much, a little bit less thrust than the actual BE-4 engine. So you can imagine that, you know, they're basically doubling the thrust at liftoff just by strapping on two of those little rocket boosters. So, um, yeah, let's keep going here. Um, this is from, uh, speaking of boosters, from uh, Pendergast Orbitals. Why don't they put six boosters on the rocket to test the structure? Is it because they would have uh, too much fuel left over uh, with a light payload? So basically, it'd just be wasted money. Uh, you can validate a lot of your models and everything that they uh, you know, were considering with two boosters. Um, adding, you know, ULA's flown with boosters forever. Literally since the inception of, of ULA, they've used solid rocket boosters on their Delta IV medium, on their Delta II, which at some point could have up to nine solid rocket boosters around around its uh, di much smaller diameter. I think its diameter is 3.7 meters, or was it even smaller? It might've been like 2.5 meters wide, but it fit nine solid rocket boosters around it. Uh, obviously the Atlas V can have up to five in an asymmetrical configuration too, which is which is fun. Um, so, I mean, I, I yeah, they I think they know how to handle uh, the loads of solid rocket boosters. Um, and having two is, is going to give them as much data as possible without wasting additional money or without wasting additional performance. Yeah. Let's keep going here. Uh, this is from uh, Country Fuchsius. Are you doing a lot of physical training or other types of training for your mission? So, no. Uh, I mean, at this point, we're, you know, uh, the Dear Moon crew is waiting for Starship to become um, ready and more operational. Obviously, we have a lot of milestones to see with Starship. It needs to you know, be able to get to orbit, needs to be able to deploy payloads, needs to be able to uh, get an orbital refueling depot ready to go. And, you know, when we start to see these milestones get ticked off, uh, re-entry obviously and, and landing and all the, the big important milestones there too. As we see those those milestones get checked off, then, you know, our we'll we'll start firing up the, the gears on our, on our end. And that's obviously something that I cannot wait for. That's going to be very exciting. But um, I'm just trying to stay in shape, but it's been not going that well for me. Uh, although I, I have been back at it lately. Uh, but yeah, the last couple months have been just ever since ever since the last Starship launch, I've been so far off my routine and working way too much. So um, yeah, that gives you a sense of of the priorities. So uh, not yet, but you know, we're just on standby waiting, ready to go. Everyone's still excited. So uh, this is cool. This is from Nelson Clark saying Astrobotic has a really cool interactive exhibit that you can see in the clean room where they built Peregrine. That's awesome. I did not know that. I appreciate you letting me know that, Nelson. I, I would love to see them. They're in Pittsburgh. Um, very cool. And yeah, so they're talking more about Peregrine right now. Uh, let's see here. This is from David Fairchild. Really interesting the way Astrotech uh, fuels the rockets. They do on the mainland and transport it over to the Cape on self-propelled trailers. Um, oh, really? On self-propelled trailers? That's cool. I did not know that. Huh. Huh. Sorry, I'm just trying to grasp. So I have not seen that at all. That's that's awesome. Um, oh, man. Garrett Graves. This does make me happy, sad, proud, and sad again. Because, yeah, our Falcon 9 model rockets, as you guys know, uh, are, you know, our metal Falcon 9 model rockets, they're based on B-1058. And, uh, unfortunately, we lost that one here just a couple weeks ago. Uh, as it was being recovered and uh, on its way back in from its, it was its 19th mission. It flew 19 times, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful rocket with the NASA worm logo. This is also the first booster to ever fly humans for SpaceX with the Crew Dragon capsule with Bob and Doug for DM2. Uh, when was that? May of, May or June of 2020. 
I don't quite remember. Um, yeah, for DM2. Uh, that, that rocket, I, I'm glad, I'm so glad that we actually did choose uh, to do 1058. To me, that was just a no brainer. I love that rocket. I love the NASA insignia on it. I have a strong emotional connection to that rocket. So it was the no brainer choice to have it be something special. And now it's even more special now that it's, that is bye bye. Um, let's see, this is uh, from Jeff Nicholas. Which science experience are commissioned on this flight? Well, we talked about that in our pre-launch preview. There are about a million, a million, barely exaggerating. Look at all these. Originally planned for 24 payloads, they're now down to 21 from for technical complications. But here, near infrared volatile spectrometer, linear energy transfer spectrometer, neutron spectrometer systems, laser reflectometer array, peregrine ion trap mass spectrometer, navigation Doppler LIDAR, Lynx UNAM, uh, Bitmex, astrobotic terrain and relative navigation. That's just, I mean, it's, it is a standalone system for them, but yeah, it's uh, a Bitcoin. Uh, incorporated is that what it is? Yeah, Je wait, Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, copy the Genesis block, the first block of Bitcoin, Astro Scale, Iris Lunar Rover, Moon Arc, Elysium Space, Celestis, M42, DHL Moonbox, Lunar Mission One, Pulley Space Technologies, Space Bit Plaque, the Arch Mission Foundation. I was gonna say many, many more, but that's 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 actually that's it. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question, Jeff. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, oh, this is awesome. Thank you, Perfect Republic. I appreciate you sticking around and, and watching along with me. I obviously just enjoy these missions. I enjoy spaceflight, and I'm so excited to see another rocket fly successfully. So uh, stand by, like I said, for I will be having a video comparing this rocket to some other vehicles. And uh, I'll try to get that out here. I'll try really hard to get that out here before I leave for the Astro Awards this weekend. So, um, let's see. Um, this is, yeah, from um, Bobak Joshi saying, or Joshi maybe, uh, the, the fairing length looks really long. Can they do something similar to what SpaceX does in their Falcon 9 rocket upper stage where they stack could do multiple payloads? Of course. And actually, they specifically can do tandem orientation, or orientation, yeah, uh, which is something that's very common uh, for the Ariane 5 to do, where they actually have a secondary payload adapter inside there that basically carries two, you can have two huge, relatively huge, you know, uh, satellites sharing a ride. If they're both going out to say geostationary transfer orbit or something, they can co-ride together. But of course, you know, you could always do like a, you know, a Christmas tree payload adapter configuration thing like what SpaceX does for the transporter missions. It is a huge fairing. I believe it's over 300 cubic meters of volume. It's almost twice as much volume as SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy fairing. So it is massive. Um, this is from Travis Hagen. Thank you so much. Love the Mercury rockets. Thanks for making all your videos. I wish there was more to make videos on, but we're steaming into new territories. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have, I have a never ending list of videos to make. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I wish there, oh, I wish there was more to make video. Oh, I see, I see, I see. I see what you're saying. Well, thank you for your support. That 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 means a lot. And yes, I, I always say this, especially at the beginning of the year, I, I sit there and go, man, I just wish that this year I could just sit and only make videos and not worry about any of the other things like live rocket launches and blah, 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 blah. And here we are preparing for the Astro Awards. Here we are with a list, a never ending list. I literally have four videos in the queue. Like there'll be two shot by tomorrow morning now that are in the edit and literally like a, another two tours from European launch providers that I've shot that will be edited together. And I have, oh my gosh, I have, I started shooting other content for another video. I have four videos currently like in the works. It is, we need way more time in the day, way more time. It's just ridiculous. Man, I am just still like, I'm not even tired because I'm, so elated that the mission went so well. It just makes me excited to see a new launch vehicle. Um, yeah, just do do well. Uh, Pharaoh Black, I have some terrible news for all of us pointy end up flaming and down connoisseurs. I forgot to say it. When the computer crashed 
and like I had to pop the stream back up. I panicked and totally forgot about pointing and up flaming and down. But you know what? Maybe, maybe I've been the bearer of bad news whenever I do that. No, I guess I'm not superstitious in that way at all. It's just something fun we do. Um, yeah, I know that my verbalization of something currently here in Iowa would have no effect on a vehicle and a program and the systems and engineering over there in Florida. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't subscribe to any of that, but it is, it is just a fun thing to do and a fun thing for all of us to make fun of me when I forget to do it. So there you go. Um, this is from, uh, Ryan Sullivan, big shout out from Midland, Texas. What's the size comparison of Vulcan to Falcon? Also see you next week in Austin. I can't wait, Ryan. Thank you for saying hi. And I'm, I'm excited to meet, uh, everyone next week. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, yeah, I can't wait. Uh, size comparison from, uh, Vulcan. Vulcan's not that much taller than the, it's, it's, a, it's taller. I think it's uh 50.3 meters tall compared to about 45 meters tall. Just the booster. Um, oh, it's 58 meters, 0.3 meters tall. So it's, it's, uh, it's about as tall as the Falcon 9 with just the first two stages. But the Falcon 9 is 3.7 meters wide. I wish I had this video done. Then you could just see all the, the data. It'd be about this tall in scale compared to the Falcon 9. No payload fairing or payload on top of it. Uh, Falcon 9 is 3.7 meters wide. Vulcan is 5.4. So she big and chonky. Uh, some of the reasons it's that big, the BE-4 engine is pretty massive. So in order to fit two of them, you have to have a fairly wide vehicle. But it also... If you want to have the same, the proper amount of propellant mass, uh, you know, that you need for your mission, you can either make the, you know, if you have to get the, whatever volume of, of propellant you need, um, you can either make the, the rocket taller or wider. And it had to be able to fit inside the same uh, vertical assembly building um, as the, uh, as the Atlas V, since that's the pad it's sharing. So that was another consideration, a constraint, is it would all have to fit inside that same building. I think we're coming up on second second light of the main engine so let me, let me and we've up. begun pressurizing the propellant tanks in preparation for second burn you can see the ullage thrusters coming up on LH2 pre-start Madagascar at the moment. LH2 pre-start. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 43 minutes, 8 seconds. Coming up next is the second main engine start of ULA's Centaur upper stage. Let's listen in. Change to the start position. Everything looking good. About 15 seconds to mess. <laughs> mess. Main engine start to mess. We have ignition, full thrust. Two good engines. Everything looking good. Yes. Love to hear it. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 43 minutes 57 seconds. As we approach Peregrine separation, let's learn more about the first spacecraft to launch in NASA's new CLIPS initiative to have American... I do need to say, remember, this is not just an animation. It's actually a graphic with real-time telemetry. So it, what you're seeing, the little little movements and stuff, is actually is real. So uh, it's real-time data. So when you don't have a good enough downlink from uh, ground-based stations, they at least give us something. And, and what that something is is... is you know, they, they get some data, obviously, from the vehicle being you know, streamed back in through either the Teeter satellites or other uh, low bandwidth infrastructure that allows them to be able to still receive and, and receive data from the rocket, which is important if something were to go wrong. It, ha it helps a lot in mishap investigations, too. In the future, uh, vehicles could start relying on Starlink and other constellations to be able to provide high bandwidth streaming of data all the whole time through the launch and, and potentially even through most of re-entry as well, uh, assuming they can kind of sneak it through the, the plasma wake. 
But yeah, it's uh, right now it's kind of frustrating, you know, when you have missions and they go dark, so to speak. You know, this happens to all rocket companies. Uh, no matter where they're flying at some point, there's just not good enough ground coverage. That's actually something that is going to be tested uh, by uh, the next Polaris, the Polaris Dawn mission, or the first Polaris mission, actually. It's the second mission for Jared Isaacman uh, and, his, and his team now, basically. Uh, they're going to be flying uh, on Dragon Capsule, and that Dragon Capsule is going to have Starlink, and they're going to be testing Starlink from different altitudes in space, which is really, really, really cool. So, um, yeah, so by the way, yeah, this, this burn is four minutes. Again, these RL-10s are very low thrust. They are high-performing. They're like over 450 seconds of specific impulse, which is ridiculous. Um, but they are very, very low thrust, like 100 and... Uh, five or 110 kilonewtons of thrust so so very 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 low output you know only a little over 200 kilonewtons of thrust altogether compared to say um, uh, for the two engines and compared to the merlin 1d which is closer to what is it like 900 nine something hang on let me just look it up here uh the uh do 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 that's annoying to just hold that for that long uh the <laughs> 981 kilonewtons of thrust. So, yeah, the single Merlin 1D vacuum engine that's on the upper stage of Falcon 9, this guy here, uh, is almost five times more powerful than the two engines currently running on the Centaur. But power doesn't really matter in space. It, it does matter sometimes. There's certain situations where a high thrust rate ratio in space can help make mission management and planning easier. Um, but for the most part, a high thrust weight ratio doesn't really matter. The, the total impulse, the or specific impulse, is generally considered more advantageous. It just means you have longer, slower burn times, uh, which can lead to their own inefficiencies. But yeah. Seven minutes, eight seconds. We're a few seconds from the second main engine cutoff. Here's Rob Gannon. 30 seconds to nominal Miko. Twenty seconds. And we're going to open loop on PU. Coming up on cutoff. We have cutoff. Everything is looking good. Fantastic. And we are now in a two minute forty nine second coast phase of spacecraft separation. We've got full settling going. After Miko. And we're reorienting to spacecraft sub attitude. Oh wait, wait, wait! Yeah, that's I, I missed this. So there, that was the TLI, right? And they're putting this officially is putting the Peregrine lander onto its trajectory, and then they'll separate from it and do a third burn, which will get it into deep space. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I, I I forgot that was the the order of things. That's and continue to maneuver to our mess two attitude. So at this point, assuming the Peregrine lander separates, they've had a totally successful mission to the moon on on their behalf. Now whether or not it lights for a third time would be kind of a bonus at this point because it's like it's just uh, more or less frivolously just putting itself into deep space. You know, I think just to kind of test relight capabilities and push the push the vehicle. You know, as far as they can for their first test flight. Why not? So we're coming up on, we have a minute and a half until Peregrine separation when the lunar lander gets ejected from there. And we'll, so already both these, uh, it's important to remember that, um, it's important to remember that the vehicle and the stage, if the stage does not accelerate again, that it's already put the, the that it and the lander are already going to the moon. They're already on the translunar injection. Their, their trajectory currently would take them up to the moon's altitude, but it would also bring it back down. So without any other change in velocity, um, they're going to be going up to the moon basically, and it's up to the Peregrine lander itself to actually finalize and get itself into lunar orbit um, through a series of burns that will, again, it nominally take it up to about February 23rd landing. So it's actually a long time. It's a slow, patient, patient game for, for this little guy. Uh, but yeah, but needless to say that the vehicle has done its the bulk of the work. The last burn will be getting it just out of the Earth system, putting it into deep space. So we're coming up on that. I want to listen in here. 
20 seconds. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 50 minutes, 10 seconds. Vulcan has executed all mission events expected, and we are now approaching delivery of the astrobotic Peregrine commercial lunar lander into a highly elliptical orbit, more than 220,000 miles above Earth to intercept the moon. Let's return to flight commentator Rob Gannon as we approach separation. We are spinning down. They just did it. And we are now in a... Uh, 28 minute coast period, the third burn of Centaur. Yes. Yes. That's incredible. Heck of a first mission. That is a heck of a first mission. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus 51 minutes, six seconds. Uh, we just heard confirmation of Peregrine spacecraft separation. Uh, I'm now back with ULA President and CEO, Tori Bruno. <laughs> Tori, yes. our first Vulcan rocket just delivered its first payload to orbit. How are you feeling? Yeehaw! <laughs> I am so thrilled, I can't tell you how much. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, again, we're not completely done with the mission here today. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? I am so proud of this team. Oh my gosh, this has been years of hard work. So far, this has been an absolutely beautiful mission. Back to the moon and off to our next burn where we will do our final payload deployment to that heliocentric orbit for the memorial. Our team has done such a good job. Bravo, Sue, Zulu, to everyone. This is uh, just, it's hard to describe. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel that too. So um, again, thank you so much for joining us on our show. Congratulations, and we'll let you get back to, to finish the rest of the mission. Congratulations to you. Give me a hug. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Yay. That makes me happy. That makes me happy. This right here. This is, and this is the, the, the sentiment. I wish this had happened. If this had flown uh, when it was originally supposed to fly of December 24th, they would have been top tier for the Astro Awards. And I just love the celebration that we can be here and cheer on these people that have worked so hard on a program to see it be pulled off like this on, on the first flight. Fantastic. Just huge congratulations to everyone there at ULA. And, and of course, also Astrobotic at this point and all the other partners, NASA as well. And the, the CLIPS program, this is the first lunar lander for the CLIPS program. So Fantastic. This is just, a, it's, ah, oh, missions like this make me excited. They make me hopeful and excited for the future. So, man, I love it. Um, all right, let's, um, I'll, I've got a few more questions to answer here. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, I'm going to just wait until we get that third burn just so we know that everything's perfect. And that'll make me very, very happy to know. Man, I want to stick around for that. Although I could just go to bed. Because I was going to wake up nice and early to try and finish that video. Hmm. Hey, for those of you that were in Discord, by the way, and listened to the script read-through, so far it's all been right. I did, I was like, do we put contingencies in here? Uh, if, if it didn't go well, you know, like, because the first line is like, ULA just launched their Vulcan rocket, you know? And it's like, that would have been a bad way to start it. It's like, ULA's rocket blew up on the path. You know, like, I, I wanted it to obviously just be a, a nuts and bolts comparison of, of rockets that are flying, so um, yeah, crazy. I don't know. I could I could go to bed, but we got a few more questions to answer anyway. Uh, from Patrick Walzer, I share the sentiment, man, that was awesome. But that power slider lean on the pad scared me for a second. I want to take a second and, and actually replay the launch just for a second because I do want to watch that again because um, it was it was pretty exciting. And I and I, since I messed up the sound, here's your opportunity to hear it with sound. Five, four, three, we have ignition. And liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket, launching a new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. Two good SRBs hitting peak pressure on the SRBs. So that, yeah, that was quite the lean, I mean, I'd have to assume that's intentional. Again, just to make sure that it 
doesn't damage any of the, the launch tower there that's a vital part of the crew program. We have ignition. Rattles. And liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket, launching a new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. And you know, the fun thing is, if it wasn't intentional, and that was way off, <laughs> then uh, then they'll learn from <laughs> then they'll learn from it. Nothing can beat. There's a lot that that uh, <laughs> that have been crazier than that. I mean, you have even the first Falcon 9 launch ever uh, ro rolled like rotated, you know, on its on its technically Z axis because Z goes to the Z. Or, uh, I always forget. Uh, I have a video about why do rockets roll, and we talked about that. And the axes aren't what you'd think because it's it's lined up like an aircraft. So Z axis. Okay, yeah. Anyway, it rolled like 45 degrees when it lifted off the pad, like right at liftoff. It goes. Rrr. And it was quite scary looking. Um, of course, you have other, uh, you know, the first Starship launch also pitched way over. I wouldn't consider that something to maybe um, <laughs> to adhere to or to try to live up to. Uh, maybe don't follow that first flight profile too closely. Uh, Astro, of course, had the famous power slide off the pad, which was so epic. The ultimate power slide. Um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, let's see here. This is from Pedro. Um, Pedro Malhiros, um, are there any commercial reasons to explore slash colonize space outside of satellites or tourism without a financial motive? How do you see colonization? I think, oh, hang on. Communications with Peregrine with earliest AOS at 080905 UTC in approximate two and a half minutes. Uh, to repeat, the mission team is still waiting for communication with Peregrine with the earliest AOS expected at 080905 UTC. And folks, that was Alex Van Hoven, our flight director on console. He is calling out UTC times, or sort of space times, and, and we're waiting for that acquisition of signal with the Peregrine spacecraft. So they uh, were, especially... At 0818 UTC. Oh. Earliest AOS at 0818 oh, UTC. Oh, 0818, so we're fine. We have two minutes then, basically, before... Uh, that's the f earliest acquisition, so I'll probably listen in here in case. Now you can almost see Alex Van Hoven in the back row, right below the eye in Astrobotic. Uh, you can kind of see his head. Maybe he'll stand up for us at least one time. We'll see. He's very focused and busy. Yeah, they're waiting for acquisition of signal of the lunar lander now that it is free flying. Today we have three of six flight directors on console for launch. Once we establish communications with Peregrine and the spacecraft officially begins its journey towards the moon, the flight directors will work in shifts so there is always one present in mission control. I would ask them to all give a wave, but they're definitely laser focused on their screens checking up on the spacecraft. Now Alex, um, he's giving us those live updates and he is also senior aerospace engineer and he oversaw the development of Peregrine's in-flight procedures. He developed his flight expertise as part of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Broadcast Mission Control Flight Director Announcement. I repeat, Broadcast Mission Control Flight Director Announcement. Uh, at this time, Astrobotic has confirmed uh, that we have established communications uh, with Peregrine and we are now receiving live commentary. I repeat, uh, we have just established communications with uh, DSN and can confirm that we are receiving telemetry from the satellite. Fantastic. Be excited, guys. Your, your lunar lander is alive. And you have communications with it. Um, my goodness. We have received signal with the Peregrine spacecraft and we are communicating it with it here on Earth. You just heard it from Alex. The team will begin sending commands to Peregrine to continue its journey to the lunar surface. What an incredible day. Now, thank you so much for continuing to tune in with us to watch this historic launch of Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander on its journey to the moon. I'm Olivia Chaplow with Astrobotic, and I, it is such a happy day for Astrobotic. I, I'm kind of speechless. Um, so back to Megan at the hostess. Thank you very much. Well, sorry, guys. I didn't have... I had my face big and dumb again. I'm sorry. I'm like looking at OBS and I'm like, 
I'm sorry about that, but oh well, we're mostly listening to things anyway. So um, let me uh, let me talk uh, answer this question. So outside of commercial reasons to explore space without a financial motive, how do you see space colonization? You know what? The biggest motive I think for space exploration without if you if you're not talking about purely uh, financial and commercial would be if we knew there was a, an asteroid heading our way that would end all life on Earth as we know it. Uh, or has the potential to end all life on Earth as we know it. Uh, and we had, let's say, six years to prepare ourselves. I think that'd be a pretty big motivation. That'd be, I think that, I don't know what that would do. I feel like society would likely just collapse because I don't think people would be fighting over who gets to leave and do what and where and why. But um, you know that there'd be a big push, though, still to to develop uh, rockets and, and technologies to try to you know, deflect the asteroid and do all these things. I, I think that, and that's a big one. And obviously colonization, I, that's a big reason that, um, you know, that's a big reason I think that Elon Musk has always talked about Mars as being an analog backup of the of human consciousness. Um, I've always thought that to be a little bit, uh, almost maybe too poetic or maybe too grandeur, maybe. Um, but I, there is, there is some truth to that, of course. I mean, you just never know when life on Earth could be completely disrupted. And if and although life on Mars would be horrible compared to life on Earth, let me make that very clear. People, you know, why would you want to live on Mars? It's like, no, I, no sane person wants to live on Mars. It'd be terrible. But um, when you're looking at, you know, uh, the other option of like, if we have no other backups, if we don't have humans living anywhere else outside of our own planet at all, then you do look at it as like, well... It would be nice if we had some other some other homes, you know, if we had some other places. So, um, yeah. Okay, Redcoat has a point here. ULA is wrong. The lacrosse, uh, you say the word landed on the moon. Um, saying is the only American landing after Apollo 17. I don't know if you can consider an intentional crashing into the moon to be an intentional landing. Uh, I mean, yes, it was, it's, it was its, its mission. It made contact with the moon, but it's not a soft landing. So I don't, I don't consider that to be the, the same thing as what, as what they're attempting to do. Um, yeah. Um, let's see from Michael Maxey. This might be a little bit old. Sorry. Hello from Houston, Texas. Main engine second start, uh, will burn only four minutes before cutoff then peregrine separation. Yeah. Thank you for that, Michael. Sorry that I had missed that. And that has now all passed. <laughs> I am being a bad host. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's a litho break. I mean, it is it is going to the moon just very, 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 very fast. Um, um, she's reminding us that it's February twenty third. Um, yeah, not not talking about soft landing. So yeah, a little little bit different. Um, uh, so this is a great question from uh, Captain D Sync. I hope we helped answer this question just natively. Again, we mentioned that the single Merlin engine on the Falcon 9 has 981 kilonewtons of thrust. Oh, I think, are they done broadcasting? Maybe I should have been listening. 981 kilonewtons of thrust. Um, and where did I, did, I, did I put the wrong amateur hour up on screen? I'm sorry, Captain Deesling. Eric Peterson, why does it take so long for the second stage to reach orbital velocity, at least compared to Falcons? Um, again, uh, it's because the Merlin, the single one Merlin D vacuum optimized one D. Wow, I'm it's getting late. Uh, has almost five times the thrust of those two RL tens because the RL tens, uh, in combined, get a little over two hundred kilonewtons of thrust. So, um, that's the main reason. Just low thrust to weight ratio. We even heard them call out at one point. They go, it's producing 0.5 Gs of thrust, like near the end of its burn. So it's. That's why the first stage needs to do so much work because if the first stage didn't do that much work and you just let go of the upper stage, like say you just did a, like a return to launch site landing uh, mission like a Falcon 9 where they loft it you know, way up and they don't have the booster, put too much horizontal velocity and they kind of keep it more vertical and then come down. Um, the, the Merlin or the upper stage of, of Falcon 9 in those cases need to do a lot more work you know, because... Uh, the booster doesn't do so much work, right? But what that means is it has to have a high enough thrust to weight ratio that by the time it gets lofted up, if you're aiming sideways or horizontally, it's falling back to earth basically. So it needs to be able to do that whole burn before it re-enters 
Um, yeah, I, sorry, I'm, I'm not doing a very good job of describing this, but uh, if you've ever played Kerbal Space Program, if you have too low of a thrust to weight ratio on your upper stage, you'll see that it sinks and it will end up re-entering. Um, and so that's why the first stage needs to do a lot of that burn because the thrust to weight ratio is just so stinking low on the Vulcan with the RL-10s. But again, super, 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 um, yeah, it's actually not, it technically, uh, literally me, it's, it's technically not gravity losses. And I've had this argument with, with some incredibly smart people who, who I, I trust on these, on these topics. But when you're flying in an upper stage and you're perpendicular to your gravity vector, you are not fighting gravity. You are in a race against gravity because gravity is going to pull you down and and potentially have you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, in which case you will no longer be able to get to orbit, right? You'll, you'll not get to orbit. But it's not technically gravity drag or gravity loss because you're not losing your potential acceleration against Earth's gravitational pull. Now, as soon as you, if you start to do any of this movement, if you're starting to have um, any vertical, uh, you know, vertical velocity, uh, like you say, you had to loft yourself up a little bit during your your injection, then you can technically start to have uh, uh, gr you'll have some gravity losses. But it's not really gravity losses; it's actually, cosine losses because you're you're technically moving your vehicle uh, against the direction you're trying to accelerate it with, and so you're just doing that in order to fight gravity. So it is kind of gravity losses, but it's technically cosine losses because you're blah 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 blah. blah. Um, yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> Um, so there we go. Um, those are some stuff. Um, yeah. Well, my friends, we are coming up. When do they say the thing is? I'm getting really tired, actually. <laughs> and I kind of just want to know if this went well in the comfort of my own bed as I'm trying to fall asleep. This is late for me. I'm, I'm normally head on the pillow by midnight is my, my general rule of thumb. Although... Not always, not always on. Um, so, so far we don't really have anything coming in audio for them, so. Huh. When was the third burn? Oh, yeah, T118. Okay, so I guess we are 11 minutes. I can survive 11 more minutes. <laughs> I can do it. My speech isn't slurring. I'm just getting delusionally tired. I'm... I should be wired up though. If it's if I was there in person, I'd be, I'd have a hard time sleeping tonight because that looked like a very very exciting mission. No, I'll stay up. I'll stay up. We only have like n ten more minutes. I can do it. Did it go straight up due to SRBs? Was a question from. Let me see where this was from S Stephen. Give me some good questions, guys. I'll I'll queue them up here. Did it go straight up due to SRBs? Uh, no. So. All rockets will, will go straight up initially. Um, and and it very clearly, Vulcan did not go just straight up. It had to loft. It had, again, it had to do a lot of horizontal velocity uh, with its first stage so that it, uh, you know, doesn't have a sink rate of the upper stage where it can complete its burn before it reenters the atmosphere. Um, this is Vulcan but, Mission Control at T plus one hour, eight minutes. The Vulcan rocket we saw today has a distinctive look. Here is a behind the scenes view at how this was accomplished. Cool. I'll take a behind the scenes view of the paint job. I'm, I am, I do appreciate that they spent the, the effort to, to give it a special paint job. I thought that was really fun. Um, okay, so straight up due to SRBs. So to, due to the solid rocket boosters, all rockets initially will accelerate, at least most rockets will accelerate straight up to get out of the bulk of the atmosphere. You want to get out of that thick atmosphere that's going to slow you down as quickly as possible. Not just slow you down, but the faster you go, the you know the more and more that uh, the atmosphere just becomes a, an absolute danger because as you compress it, as you're speeding up, you know it will heat up. It, it eventually, if you go too fast, it'll turn it into a plasma and you'll absolutely just, the heating uh, element on the vehicle will destroy it for sure. Uh, unless you wanted to take all these new considerations into, you know, heat proofing and, and doing all these thermal management devices in order to fly faster in the lower parts of the atmosphere. Uh, but the conventional wisdom and, and what has been proven to be the most optimized flight profiles to get out of the majority of the atmosphere by flying vertically at first. So you're accelerating, you're, you know, you're punching a hole basically through the atmosphere more or less. 
And, and kind of as you're starting to do that, you do want to start getting some horizontal velocity because again, you have to get that 28,000 kilometers an hour, 17,500 mile an hour uh, of horizontal velocity in order to actually be in orbit. Now, again, if this is confusing to you, I, I did a pretty deep dive on orbit versus suborbit. So I have a video on, on that if you want to look that up. It's actually a really good video. Even if you have played Kerbal Space Program, you, you inherently know the difference between orbit and suborbit. I still recommend that video because it actually, it's it's got some awesome graphics that really help. I've, I've heard people say like, I have a degree in this and I've never quite visualized it properly until I saw this video and I was like, yes, I, that means the world to me. So we did a lot of cool visuals for it um, as we always try to do. We always strive for that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the optimal pro pro flight profile always does start off with a vertical uh, going straight up and then that doesn't have much to do with um, SRBs. So... Uh, I don't know if we have any more hosts in here, but if we could get a few more questions, I'll, I'll, I'll still manually do a few questions in our queue, but um, let's see here. So this is from uh, Spaceman. A good question. Do I have any update on the oil rig set up for SpaceX? The update is that they've scrapped <laughs> the oil rigs uh, physically for now. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that might not last. Uh, they might go back to an oil rig idea, but it, it was, I think they were a little premature to get the oil rigs when they did, because really look at how often they're sending things to the launch pad and making changes to the launch pad, making changes to the rocket on the pad. Oh. For 11 minutes. ULA's production campus in Decatur, Alabama, recently underwent significant changes to accommodate increased manufacturing capability. Let's take a look at the progress made in 2023. Sweet, I'll watch more B-roll. Progress towards expansion, love it. So what was I saying? Um, yeah, they, they scrapped, so really, oil an oil and a uh, sea launch platform like that does not really make sense until they have absolutely like ironed out all the main issues of Starship and the Starship launch infrastructure and, and stage zero. Um, and I don't think they're going to be uh, uh, it would be cool to see if stage zero were going to be built on other countries as well. I don't know if that's ever going to be the case. I think most likely they just launch them relatively close to the shore, but where it's a little bit better for, for uh, performance potentially, and also better for, you know, marine traffic and air traffic and, uh, and being a good neighbor without tons of noise and stuff like that would be another consideration too. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the update. Uh, so, Matt, great question. Any idea how often we might see Vulcan Centaur launch in the future? Considering how great this first mission turned out, I can see them being sought after by companies that do heavier payloads. So, they have about 70 launches on contract. Uh, 38 of those are Kuiper uh, satellite constellations for Amazon. They have about 20 between the Space Force and Department of Defense. They have six Sierra Nevada uh, Dream Chaser missions. And I think they have a couple more just regular like commercial... GPS type missions. Uh, it's it's definitely the main, they're really going for those high energy orbits. So geostationary transfer orbit and direct to geo orbit with large vehicles, which is why they have such a large fairing. Uh, they are aiming for, you know, this is very squarely aimed at the Department of Defense. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, and I, I think they nailed it. And, and obviously they, they won, you know, over a billion dollars in, in contracts with the with Space Force. So they obviously hit the nail right on the head for, you know, kind of the, their target market, which was which was Space Force. Uh, let's see here. This is from uh, Falconator. Good to hear from you. Uh, what provided the power for the separation of the Peregrine? Springs? They didn't fire any engines on Peregrine. Um, I'm not sure the exact stage separation mechanism. That might be in the payload user's guide for Vulcan. Uh, you know, SpaceX uses a spring-loaded mechanism and, and a clamp that kind of holds, you know, compresses it and holds it in place and then release the clamp. Uh, ULA in the past has used frangible bolts, you know, and, and um, pyrotechnics for, for separation. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly they used in this case. Um, this is from Michael Maxey. Again, good to hear from you again, Michael. Uh, Tim, the C platforms would be a good choice for landing and some launches to, uh, for, to geostationary orbit. You're right. If they if they were launching, you know, at the equator, that would definitely be a performance boost. Uh, we're we're talk we talked about that in a recent video about uh, why not launch from the equator or from mountains. Um, but you know the again, 
in the future, say they, they get all the kinks worked out and Starship's flying very often. Let's say it's flying as often as the Falcon 9. And uh, there's still a lot of considerations, though, to to maintaining a fleet out on the ocean. I mean, it just is, it's remote, so it's hard to get, you know, your crew out there. We talk about that again in that, that video. That video actually is what I should recommend. Watch that video. Uh, the Yeah, why not launch rockets from mountaintops or from the equator? Because we do go into all those logistical challenges. Um, but you're, of course, there are advantages to, to doing things like that, to doing sea launch. But there's, oh. E plus one hour, 15 minutes. Along with meeting numerous milestones towards the first launch of the Vulcan rocket, ULA continued to launch Atlas and Delta rockets this year. Let's take a look back at those liftoffs. Cool. Again, I'll take all the B-roll I can get right now. Love it. Give me some rocket goodness. Um, yeah, it's, it's about compromises, though. You know, it's how much complexity are you adding and how much does it cost to... To have crew go to and from all these places, and if something goes wrong, what do you do? And how do you ship this stuff? And how do you ship all the propellant? And blah 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 blah. And at the end of the day, it just what's the cost? And is that performance worthy of the cost and the investment and all of the other things? So great questions, though. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'll keep trying to. Uh, Keep trying to answer some questions here from you guys. Just trying to go through some of your questions. Uh, this is from Spaceman. Uh, again, hello, again. Tim, when SpaceX presented BFR, one important take uh, were Earth-to-Earth -earth travel. Wouldn't that still be important to keep costs down by making rocket travel more available? I mean, absolutely. I I've always had the point-to-point -point Earth transportation, humans point-to-point, -point, was extremely ambitious. Um... But with enough flight data and enough flight reliability and flight time, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, I'm going to miss Atlas when it's gone, by the way. It is a cool rocket. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely still an important thing, but it's that is extremely ambitious when you actually look at the what it would take to do point-to-point -point human transportation with a rocket the size of, of Starship. Um Let's see here. Oh, that's awesome. Tegan, good to hear from you. Yes, and for Micah and Micah's family. I, I believe they were at the launch. So Micah has uh, is flying with Celestis, um, saying, uh, ready to see Micah fly in Vulcan here. What are your thoughts on those memorial space flights and the business behind it? Um, we're coming up on, th on third engine burn here. I'm going to answer that in a second, but I just did want to say hello to, to Micah's family uh, to his, his wife and child. Uh, I hope that the flight was, uh, something memor uh, memorable and special. Um, I was thinking about you guys during launch, so, uh, congratulations. And, um, yeah, pretty amazing to have a loved one out there deep amongst the stars. Ignition, full thrust. Yeah. Both engines are up and running. We've now achieved Earth Escape. Coming up on cutoff. Cutoff. Right on time. Everything was nominal. And with the completion of this Earth Escape burn, this concludes the commentary for the flight of EC-1. This is Vulcan Mission Control at T plus one hour, 19 minutes. We just heard flight commentator Rob Gannon confirm the successful final burn of ULA's Centaur upper stage, carrying the Celestis Memorial spaceflight payload to deep space. We'll now conclude our live coverage. For more information on the Vulcan rocket, visit ULALaunch.com. I'm Amanda Sterling, and thank you for joining me on this historic day. Before we sign off, let's take another look at the inaugural Vulcan rocket lifting off the pad for the first time. Amazing. Oh, I love how excited she is. Uh, that genuine excitement just ten. brings me to Let's listen in and watch one eight, more time. Seven, six, 
five, four, three. We have ignition. And liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket, launching a new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. Amazing. Very excited about that. Um, yeah, uh, this is from, I'll answer a few more questions and I'm getting out of here and going nighty night. Uh, from Drew Nar asking when Vulcan Heavy. So uh, Vulcan Heavy, just to remind you guys, uh, by ULA, huge congratulations, ULA. I mean, knocked it out of the park. To be honest, though, this is exactly what I expected from ULA. Like, I expect nothing less. And I think that speaks volumes of uh, the kind of work that they do. This is what we expect from a company like ULA. But this is cool because this is the first rocket they've actually developed in-house. Everything they've been flying to date was... Uh, you know, heritage from Boeing or Lockheed. So this is their first all home brewed rocket and they knocked it out of the park showing that they still got it. So uh, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the video that I'm, that I'm working on that I, I hope to have, uh, that I hope to have done here before I leave for the Astro Awards. I really will just try to knock it out. I'll try to just like knock it out tomorrow and post it on Tuesday. Jeez, if I can do that, if I do that, paint yourselves impressed i'll paint myself impressed but uh yeah that's that's uh vulcan heavy when vulcan heavy was the question from drunar again thank you for your super chat and sorry that i'm messing this all up basically so there there has been talks about a three core vulcan uh you know on that typical heavy configuration like we might be used to but um i i don't think they're gonna pursue it honestly when when they can just add six srbs uh, the, the vehicle becomes quite, I think it is considered its heavy configuration. Uh, and it is, uh, it is very powerful at that, at that point it's, it's, it can outperform the Delta four heavy. So it's when we should see that fly relatively soon. I don't know when the first mission that would require that much performance is, but I, I, I do fully expect that. So, uh, I did see a few more questions about the models that I have back there. Those ones are from, uh, those are the ULA rockets. Those are actually from the ULA store. Um, for those asking, they are not to the same scale, uh, as, uh, anything else on that shelf, which just kills me. I don't even know why I have that dumb little Saturn V. That one's to no scale. Nothing on that shelf back there is to scale, which just irks at me, which is why I'm trying so hard to produce the one 100 scale models and they're all metal, uh, that we have. So that's why that's important to me because I want them all the same scale, but I, I do believe Oh, no, not even the, well, maybe that's like a huge extended fairing or something, but actually the three, the three Volk, the three ULA ones, I think are the same scale, but that is a strange, that's a really strange fairing on Vulcan because it's normally only about 60 meters tall, whereas, uh, Delta four heavy is 72 meters tall. Vulcan is slightly wider though. The cores are 5.4 meters versus five meters of the Delta four heavy cores. So. There you go. There you go. I'm going to bed, my friends. I am going to bed. Again, one more time, don't forget, we do have a sale on our Astro Award tickets for this week only as we come up into the final stretch before before the show, the big show. This is going to be amazing, guys, and I really hope you guys tune in next Sunday. Uh, if you if you can't make it live, come, come, come watch the live stream. It'll be amazing. We're putting a lot of effort and money into producing a real show similar to like the Emmys and the Grammys an actual award show. We're going to present an award to the people behind these amazing missions. Uh, it's going to be so, so, so fun. So um, astroawards2024.com. Uh, we will be updating this list this week as we get more and more confirmations. We have more confirmations, but we are uh, waiting to the, announce them as we uh, get more information and all that kind of stuff. So um, some amazing people are going to be here. It's going to be super fun. If you guys are in Austin, especially don't miss it. Uh, but yeah, you can, uh, astroawards2024.com. They, the general mission tickets are 25% off this week. Uh, so yeah, join us, see us there, see you there. I hope to see you there. There's going to be a lot of cool people. All right, my friends, thank you for sticking with me this late, or I guess it's early depending on where you're at or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, really had a, a pleasure streaming this one. So again, huge congratulations to our friends at ULA. Everyone say, say congratulations, ULA. And also Astrobotic, can't wait to see and follow along in the progress with that mission as well. So 
it is time to go to bed. So thanks, everybody. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth. And I'm going to leave you with the song Ticker Tape Parade, which you can see me play live next Saturday, this Saturday, in Austin, Texas, for the pre-show party. We're going to be playing Everyday Astronaut music live, including this song. Bye, everybody.